This video was sponsored by Click T Shop, the hottest t-shirts in the world. What's going on, Vinyl Community and KISS Army? Welcome to another video with The Record Spinner. In today's video, I am going to be doing something completely new and different on this channel, and that is ranking studio catalogs of bands that I admire. I ran some polls on social media a while back asking if you guys would like to see this type of content, and most of you agreed on it, and I figured what better band to start off with than my favorite band of all time, and of course, the hottest band in the world, that is KISS. Now, let me preface by saying that this ranking is solely my opinion. It is neither right or wrong, and perhaps some of you guys might agree on some things, but if you think that Crazy Nights is the best KISS album ever, I respect your opinion. So, enough of the chit-chat. Let's jump into what this video is all about. Now, excluded from this ranking are various live albums and the 1978 solo albums. So, that gives us 20 KISS studio albums. And at number 20, at the bottom of the barrel, is this one. No, it is not music from The Elder. It is 1989's Hot in the Shade. Now, even though this was a bold attempt to kind of come back to the band's hard rock sound and roots towards the tail end of the 80s, uh, the reason why this album is at number 20 for me is simply because it has way too much filler. And generally, Kiss albums are very concise and to the point. Ten tracks on average, they don't overstay their welcome. But with this album, they, uh, they basically took a bunch of demos that they were working on, added some overdubs, and even had drum machines. You had Eric Carr in the lineup, who was perfectly capable of laying down some fantastic drum tracks, and yet they used dr drum machines. It boggles my mind. But I feel like I'm kind of being a bit harsh, because there is a decent 10-track album within this. Um, if they just kind of cut off the dead weight and kept it concise, it may be a bit higher in my ranking. Uh, but some of the highlights on here is um, The Ballad Forever, which was a huge hit for them at the time. Rise to It, Betrayed, Hide Your Heart, uh, Silver Spoon, Little Caesar, which was uh, Eric Carr's uh, lead vocal spot on the album and his real proper only lead vocal on a Kiss album aside from Beth on Smashes, Thrashes, and Hits. But like I said, if they cut the dead weight, this album might be a bit higher. And coming in at number 19 is this one. Carnival of Souls, The Final Sessions, released in 1997, but recorded at the tail end of 95 going into 96. Uh, this is KISS's grunge album, and even though KISS has influenced many bands in the grunge genre, um, they didn't really need to kind of tap into grunge. Uh, this was essentially Gene's way of kind of bringing the band in uh, with the modern musical climate of the 90s, thus making this album perhaps the heaviest and darkest KISS record. Uh, kind of picking up where Revenge left off at in 1992 and taking it in a much heavier and darker direction with tracks such as Hate, Master and Slave, Childhood's End, Jungle. Uh, the song I Walk Alone was uh, sung uh, by Bruce Kulick. And honest, it's just an oddity of an album because the band has never um, represented this album in the live setting. And I kind of think of how this album would have gone down if it was to come out when it was being worked on. Because literally less than a year later, uh, the original lineup got back together in full costume and makeup, did the reunion tour, and this was no longer a priority for the label. So copies were starting to get bootlegged within the circles and then the label pretty much rushed this out just as a way of beating the bootleggers with no real ways of promoting it uh, since this lineup was no longer together so honestly the reason why it's so low in this ranking is just simply because it really is an oddity of sorts coming in at 18 is this album 1987's Crazy Nights. Uh, this is perhaps the most slickest sounding Kiss album in terms of production, and with the inclusion of synthesizers and keyboards, it very much stands out as a product of the times in the uh, mid to late 80s. Um, we do get some great tracks on here, though. Uh, we have Crazy Crazy Nights, which was a huge hit in England at the time, The Ballad Reason to Live, Hell or High Water, The Frantic No, No, No. There are some cool tracks on here, but honestly, and I don't mean this in a rude way, it's kind of like Kiss does Bon Jovi in a sense. 
Coming in at number 17 is this one. Wow, this album made it this far in the ranking. 1981's Music from the Elder. And a lot can be said about this album, and I'm going to try to keep it concise. Uh, basically, the band was kind of at a crossroads. They were trying to win their fans back after they kind of went in the disco pop direction. They were going to make a hard rock album, which basically became Creatures the following year in 82. But instead, they decided to take on this uh, concept from Gene and make this concept album with Bob Ezrin and the producer's chair, uh, who had just come off of producing Pink Floyd's very successful album, The Wall. So they thought maybe that they could make Light and Strike twice, and it did not happen. This alienated fans even more, even persuaded uh, Ace Frehley to leave the band and part ways with manager Bill Coin. Now, with this album, there is a group of people that love it. There's a group of people that hate it. I am one that adores this album. This is one of my favorite Kiss albums. There, I said it. Elder is one of my favorite Kiss albums. And I say that because I'm a big prog fan. And there's some moments on this album that are very proggy in areas. Things such as, like, Just a Boy, Odyssey, things like that. But even though, like, this album is so polarizing, there are some moments on here that are very reminiscent of the classic Kiss sound with things such as Only You, The Oath, I, the closing track. Uh, but it is just really, really odd. But then again, I love this album very much. It's definitely worth a shot, but in the big picture, it's definitely interesting. <laughs> Coming in at number 16 is this album, 1984's Animal Eyes. Now, this album is quite notable since it was the best-selling Kiss album since 1979's Dynasty. Um, and we have the huge highlight on this album, which is Heavens on Fire, as well as some other cool tracks such as I've Had Enough, Into the Fire, Under the Gun, and Thrills in the Night. Uh, but there's something missing on this album, and that's Gene. Uh, basically, at this point, Gene had gone full Hollywood, was doing a whole bunch of movies and other projects, kind of leaving Kiss in Paul's hands. And both Gene and Paul had, you know, equal say in terms of what songs of theirs would go on the record. So Paul would contribute his portion, and then Gene would contribute his portion. And honestly, the Gene songs on this are just phoned in because... If you think back in the 70s, Gene was such a sexual wordsmith with things such as calling Dr. Love, Ladies Room, Got Love for Sale. But on this album, you get things like Burn Bitch Burn. Yikes. Coming in at 15 is this one. 1980s Unmasked. This is the band's pop album, and even though this album did really well in other markets in the world, particularly Australia, where it coincided with their first Australian tour, and they earned a huge hit uh, with the song Shandy, uh, musically, it just deviated even more from the sound and image that fans knew and loved from this band. Kind of gave them a bit of a more softer edge. But with that said, there are some cool tracks on here, such as Is That You, um, Ace Frehley's Talk To Me, Tomorrow, uh, You're All That I Want. Um, full of great tracks, but just definitely a bit of a softer approach for the band. Coming in at number 14 is this album. 1985's Asylum. And before I made this list, I decided to give this album a couple of spins just so I can see where it really stood out in the list simply because this is an album that I don't really go to that often. And upon listening to it again recently, I really love this album. This is a great album from these guys from the non-makeup period. And yeah, the music was kind of going in a more glam rock direction, especially their image. I mean, if you've seen the pictures of these guys from the Asylum tour, the outfits are very bright and flamboyant. But honestly, this has some real killer tracks. Uh, you have King of the Mountain, Who Wants to Be Lonely, My Favorite, which is Trial by Fire, um, Tears Are Falling, which is the huge hit from this album, uh, uh, All Night. Um, this is honestly a really solid non-makeup era album to check out. Really recommend it. Coming in at number 13 is this album, 1979's Dynasty. Everyone calls this the disco album. In all honesty, there's only two disco tracks on here. Uh, the first one being 
the huge monumental hit, I Was Made For Loving You, and uh, Peter Chris's track, Dirty Living. But aside from that, we have some really cool moments on here, such as the Gene track, Charisma, Paul's Magic Touch, and there's also a cover of the Rolling Stones song, 2000 Man, which was sung by Ace. And another big highlight on here is the song, Sure Know Something. So even though there are some cool moments on this, uh, they had become a bit more mainstream, kind of catered to a sort of kitty kind of crowd. Uh, basically, kiss shows were now turning into family affairs at this point. Um, it kind of drifted away from the harder, metallic kind of sound that made them so distinctive earlier in the 70s. Uh, it definitely was a turning point, but it did provide a really decent album. Coming in at number 12 is this album. 1998's Psycho Circus, the reunion album, or should I say, what could have been the reunion album. Uh, the original lineup does appear on a couple of moments on this record, particularly on the songs Into the Void and You Wanted the Best. Uh, you basically have Kevin Valentine at the drum kit and Tommy Thayer doing the lead guitar parts several years before he would be a full-fledged member. But as diluted as the making of this album was, there are some killer tracks on here, such as uh, the title track, uh, Within, um, I Pledge Allegiance to the State of Rock and Roll, We Are One, uh, which is a huge highlight on this album, Razor Glasses. It's really full of great tracks, but like I said, it's sad that the original lineup wasn't able to pull it together to deliver this album. Coming in at number 11 is this next album. 2009's Sonic Boom. It had been 11 years since we last saw a Kiss studio album come out. The last one being 1998 Psycho Circus with the original lineup. Flash forward uh, 11 years later, we have Gene and Paul now with Eric Singer and Tommy Thayer. And they deliver this killer album with songs such as Modern Day Delilah, Never Enough, Stand, Say Yeah, just songs that have great choruses with catchy hooks. And honestly, if you are a fan of old school Kiss, Circa, Rock and Roll Over, and Love Gun, you are going to adore this album because it is very much derivative of those classic albums. And that's the part that a lot of people kind of dock this album for as if, you know, they're kind of trying too hard to kind of emulate that sound. But then again, it's albums like Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun that made Kiss so great. And they're not really breaking any new ground. And personally, I'm not offended because this album just simply rocks. Now, before we approach the top 10 ranking, I want to give a plug to the sponsor of this video, and that is Click T Shop. Click T Shop is a company that makes Kiss themed shirts, but not just any ordinary Kiss shirts. The shirts that this company offers are destined to please diehard Kiss fans like myself. They went as far as to produce shirts that members of KISS have been seen in, such as Ace Frehley's mother shirt, Peter Chris's black cat jacket, and the shirt Eric Carr wore on the God Gave Rock and Roll to You music video. They also offer shirts uh, that are relative to notable aspects of KISS fandom, such as the talisman from KISS Meets the Phantom, Ace Frehley's smoking guitar, and Paul Stanley's rose tattoo. The coolest designs that I think they offer are the costume shirts, uh, which are perfect and expensive options for dressing up as a KISS member and not investing too much on a fancy costume. The shirt that I'm wearing in this video is the Samuel T. Serpent t-shirt, which is the serpent that was on Gene's side of the stage during the Love Gun Alive 2 tour, and once again on the recent End of the Road tour. The shirt you saw me wear in the thumbnail of this video is of Peter Chris's drum riser with the two golden cats ready to attack. If you are a diehard KISS fan and you want to own some unique KISS related t-shirts, be sure to check out Click T-Shop and I will provide a link to their site in the description box below. Coming in at the number 10 spot is 2012's Monster. Basically, this album picks up where Sonic Boom left off at and just kicks it up to a whole other level. Whereas Sonic Boom was very much a nod to their past, this, I feel, was the best logical step forward. You have some killer songs on here, such as Heller, Hallelujah, Wall of Sound, my favorite, which is Freak, 
Back to the Stone Age, The Devil Is Me, All For The Love Of Rock and Roll, Take Me Down Below. This album is just full of great tracks. It comes in at 12 songs, which is just three songs less than what Hot In The Shade has. But honestly, the songs in here are all strong and it's sequenced just brilliantly to take you on a real rockin' journey. And as of filming this video, this is their last studio album. And uh, if this turns out to be their overall last album, they ended things on a real high note. Coming in at number nine is this one, 1992's Revenge. Uh, this, I feel, is the second best non-makeup era Kiss record. Um, a lot of people will point to this as being the best one. Some people think it's overrated, but personally, I cannot get enough of this album. Whereas Hot in the Shade was kind of hinting at what was to come, this was where they finally delivered the goods and came back on solid ground. Uh, you have tracks like Unholy, God Gave Rock and Roll to You, Domino, I Just Wanna, um, just awesome killer tracks. You have a nice nod to Eric Carr with the song Car Jam 81, uh, which uh, Eric Carr had passed away as they were uh, starting to work on this album. You have some deeper cuts like Tough Love and Thou Shall Not, Heart of Chrome. Uh, you have the ballad Every Time I Look at You, which is quite good. Um, honestly, this album is just absolutely amazing. A must listen in terms of the non-makeup era. Coming in at number eight, is the best non-makeup Kiss album. 1983's Lick It Up. This was the band's first non-makeup album, and it is indeed the best one. Um, this is almost like a sister album to Creatures of the Night. Um, kind of in the same vein, same kind of songwriting, and honestly, the songs on here are fantastic. Of course, you have the title track, which was a huge hit on MTV, and it is still a concert staple. And you have some other awesome songs on here, like Exciter, Not For The Innocent, Young and Wasted, Gimme More, All Hell's Breaking Loose, Fits Like a Glove, and on the eighth day, this whole album is absolutely killer and fantastic, and hands down the best non-makeup album. Coming in at number seven is this album, 1982's Creatures of the Night. This album is just flat out ballsy, hard rocking, almost metal sounding. This is one of their heaviest albums. This is the album that should have came out after Unmasked. They really would have won their audience back with this. And then they did The Elder and that completely flopped. And then they realized holy crap, we need to get back to work. And then they delivered this album, and this is just a masterpiece. Uh, highlights on this album are I Love It Loud, War Machine, two tracks that are still being performed live to this day by the band. You have the opening title track, which just kicks this album off at juggernaut speed. Saint and Sinner, Danger, um, I Still Love You, which is one of the band's greatest ballads. Um, this is just a perfect, perfect album. And the sad thing is, this album did not really do much for them, as great as it was. Um, the tour was abysmal. They couldn't even sell out half of the places they were playing in the U.S. And um, it was kind of a calling card for these guys to take the makeup off and kind of reinvent the band. And I often wonder how this album would have done if they took off the makeup then. I guess we'll never know, but honestly, this album is absolutely killer. Creatures of the Night. And I am sure a lot of you people will fight that this album should have been higher um, in this ranking. But there are six spots left, and that leaves room for six studio albums that came out from 74 to 77. The blueprint of what made this band so great when they started out. And at number six is this album. 1975's Dress to Kill. Uh, this album was almost kind of forced out of the band because, you know, Hotter Than Hell had just come out in October of 74 and this followed suit in March of 75. So they were kind of just pumping out albums at lightning speed. Um, at this point, they were kind of you know, scrounging for material, so they uh, kind of rejiggered some Wicked Lester tracks. Uh, of course, Wicked Lester was the band that was around before Kiss, which uh, featured Gene and Paul. Uh, those songs are Lover, All I Can, and She. Uh, but aside from that, there are some shining moments on this album, like um, Come On and Love Me, Anything for My Baby, Rock Bottom, Ladies in Waiting, and of course, 
rock and roll all night. Uh, Neil Bogart produced this album. He was the uh, label um, head of uh, Casablanca Records. Kind of hoped that this album would be sort of the commercial turning point. Wasn't exactly, but it still provided some Kiss classics. Coming in at number five is this album. 1977's Love Gun. This right here is perhaps the pinnacle of Kiss's success in the 70s. What's on this album? You have I Stole Your Love, Christine 16, Shock Me, Love Gun, Almost Human, Plaster Caster. Just absolutely killer Kiss classics on this album. The only minor thing that I have with this album is the cover of Then She Kissed Me, which is a great rendition and they do a really great job with it. But I think maybe if they were to end it with a track that would be on the studio side of Alive 2, it would just kind of beef this album up a little bit. But even with that said, I still absolutely adore this album. And this is indeed the first Kiss album that I ever listened to. So it has a special place in my heart. Coming in at number four is this album. 1974's Hotter Than Hell. This is the band's second album. Some people would probably put this low on some rankings due to its poor production value, but I think it kind of adds to the charm of this album and also the track list. Got to Choose, Parasite, Hotter Than Hell, Let Me Go Rock and Roll, Watching You. Half of this album is classics. But then we get to the deep cuts. Going Blind, Strange Ways. You listen to this album and you think to yourself, oh my gosh, this is an American Black Sabbath. Absolutely killer, killer album. Coming in at number three is this one. 1976's Rock and Roll Over. Um, in the producer's chair, we have Eddie Kramer, who had produced the band's original demo back in 73, and he produced Kiss Alive, which is the greatest live album ever, and I will defend that statement to my dying day. And basically, what Eddie Kramer does on this album is capture the raw magic of this band within the context of the studio. Um, it was recorded live on location, um, I believe at a theater in New Jersey, and um, honestly, it sounds absolutely killer. Um, Eddie Kramer is um, best known for doing a whole bunch of stuff with Hendrix back in the late 60s, and uh, he really did some wonders with with Kiss back in the 70s. This album, along with Love Gun, I would say he is the ideal Kiss producer, maybe alongside Bob Ezrin. Uh, on this album, you have I Want You, Take Me, Callin' Dr. Love, um, Ladies Room, Mr. Speed, Making Love, and then we have some uh, softer moments such as uh, Hard Luck Woman. Uh, this is just a great album uh, that really captures the raw intensity of this great band within the studio. Coming in at number two is this album, Kiss, the 1974 self-titled debut. Honestly, this album is a greatest hits collection because you have Strutter, Nothing to Lose, Firehouse, Cold Gin, Deuce, 100,000 Years, Black Diamond. If you literally started with this album, you'll be off to the races. This brings together the classic early tracks that were part of the early Kiss repertoire, songs that they're still playing to this day live, many songs which appeared on Kiss Alive have been in and out of the set list for 40 plus years. This right here is what got the ball rolling, and honestly, if you started here, you'll be off to a great start. Now we're off to the number one spot, and if you've been following this video this long, you know exactly what's coming. 1976's Destroyer. This album is the best Kiss album. I, I know it's a general consensus kind of deal. A lot of people will say that everyone points to this album, but it really is their best. This is their Sgt. Pepper, essentially. And what producer Bob Ezrin did to the band on this album kind of reminds me of what he did to the original Alice Cooper band uh, when he started producing them in the early 70s. He basically took what was great about them, but just simply made it better. Um, if you look back in those first three Kiss albums, yes, they're absolutely amazing. Um, but it all kind of followed a same similar vein. Uh, it was all about rock and roll and girls and whatnot. 
and Bob Ezrin kind of got them to kind of come out of their shell a little bit and do some more different types of lyrics, more thematic type stuff. Um, and just really um, elaborated the production, added some pianos, choirs, um, organ on a couple tracks, all kinds of different things. Uh, in terms of the songs on this, you have Detroit Rock City, King of the Nighttime World, God of Thunder, Shout It Out Loud, Do You Love Me, all Kiss classics, and of course, their biggest hit, Beth. I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, this is a part of my childhood. I listened to this album nonstop growing up as a kid. And um, this album, along with the first album, are the two go-to albums if you really want to immerse yourself in this great band. So there you guys go. That is my ranking of the Kiss Studio catalog. Are there any bands that you think I should rank? Please leave a comment down below. I'd love to know. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead, give it a like, subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support this channel, be sure to check me out on Patreon. See you guys in the next video. Shout it out loud. And most importantly, keep the record spinning. Big J, when you want a t-shirt. Big J, accessories too. Click tshop.com